In this video, we solve problem 8.3.16-T from Essentials of Statistics, 6th edition by Mario Triola. The problem statement says a data set lists earthquake depths. The summary statistics are n equals 500, so we've got 500 earthquake depths. The mean of those 500 earthquake depths is 6.38 kilometers, and the standard deviation of those depths is 4.29 kilometers. We're asked to use a 0.01 significance level to test the claim of a seismologist that these earthquakes are from a population with a mean equal to 6.00. We're asked to assume that a simple random sample has been selected. And then we're asked to identify the null and alternative hypotheses, the test statistic, the p-value, and then state the final conclusion that addresses the original claim. In order to do this, I will share my paper with you. So the first thing we want to do is identify the claim so that we can use it to infer the null and alternative hypotheses. So it says that the, we have a claim of a seismologist and that seismologist says that these earthquakes are from a population with a mean equal to 6.00 kilometers. So the claim is that the mean is equal to 6.00 kilometers. If that's not true, the mean is not equal to 6.00 kilometers. Now the one that does not contain the condition of equality from these two is the alternative hypothesis. So this is the alternative hypothesis. And the null hypothesis just comes from taking the alternative hypothesis and replacing that sign with an equals sign. In that case, we actually end up with the claim again. So these are our hypotheses. We will go to my lab statistics now and make sure that that's the answer that they want. Okay, so I'm looking through this list. I'm looking for a null of, of a mean equal to zero or 6.00 kilometers. And then the alternative hypothesis is the mean is not equal to that value. So that's option B. Great. And the next thing we want is the test statistic T. And we want to round to two decimal places as needed. I'll share my paper with you again. OK, so if we want a test statistic in this case for this problem, we need to look through the problem statement and see if they give us the standard deviation of the population. We know the mean and the standard deviation of our sample. We have a significance level. And I think that's it. They don't, give it the, they don't give us the population standard deviation. I guess it's not known. So in that case, since our population standard deviation is unknown, and we have a sample size that's greater than 30, um, so that the sampling distribution of the sample means has that symmetry that we would expect, um, it's going to look a little bit like a normal distribution, but it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to be like a student T distribution. It's going to have that same basic shape, but a different standard deviation. Um, since that is the case, we're going to use this uh, T score to convert from our sampling distribution of the sample means to a student T distribution or a T value. So here's the idea. If I have the sampling distribution of the sample means, we know that under the conditions in our problem statement, that is approximately normal. And the mean of the sample means is actually equal to the population mean. And now we want to graph the sampling distribution of the sample means provided that the null hypothesis is assumed to be true. So we're going to assume that that mean is 6.00 kilometers. Now, if that's true, and we have a sample mean of 6.38 kilometers, which is more than that, so that's over here. The question becomes, is that a significantly high value of that sample mean? If it is a significantly high value, 
um, given that this assumption is true, that the true population mean is equal to 6.00 kilometers, we might say, if that's true, if that's happening, but it's supposed to be rare, well, then maybe the assumption that led us to thinking that it was supposed to be rare is wrong. So if this is significantly high, we're going to throw out the null hypothesis, which is the same as rejecting the null hypothesis. In order to figure out whether this is significantly high or low, we need to compute the corresponding test statistic. So we're going to go from this sampling distribution of X bar to a student T distribution. Now remember, student T distributions look very similar to a standard normal distribution. They have a mean equal to zero, but the standard deviation of a student T distribution is not equal to one like the standard normal distribution. The standard deviation is a little bit larger. That just means it's more spread out. Um, okay, so now we wanna convert from this X bar value to the corresponding T value. And we can do that using this formula. So we take X bar and we subtract the mean of the sample means. And then we're going to divide by the standard deviation over here. And that's approximately equal to this. And so we're going to have the, the sample mean for our sample minus the mean of the sample means, which is assumed to be um, the true mean of 6.00 kilometers assumed in our null hypothesis. And then this ends up being the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So we're going to have 6.38 minus six divided by the sample standard deviation, which is 4.29 divided by the square root of the sample size, which was 500. So that is our T value that goes with this X bar value to figure out what that is. We'll do the computation, just a little bit of arithmetic. So we've got 0.638 minus six divided by open parentheses, 4.29 divided by the square root of 500. Get out of that denominator, close parentheses for the denominator, the denominator of the larger fraction, and then hit equals. And we get a T score of zero point or excuse me, 1.9807 approximately. Okay, so that's not exactly a number of standard deviations above the mean, but it is a T value over here. That is our test statistic, 1.9807. Let's go to my lab statistics and make sure it likes this answer. We might have to round to two decimal places. We'll see in just a moment. Okay, it does ask us to round to two decimal places. So I will enter T equals 1.98. That's our test statistic T. Now we wanna determine the p-value. Now remember the p-value depends on whether you're talking about or you're dealing with a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test. In order to determine whether you're dealing with a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test, you have to go back to the alternative hypothesis. Since this has a not equal to sign, we're going to think of values as significantly different from the mean if they are either significantly high or significantly low. We don't care if we're off on the high end or off on the low end. If they're significantly different from this, um, we want to include those in our probability. So this implies that we've got a two-tailed test. And what we want for the p-value is the area over here, but doubled. Um, because it's a two-tailed test, we want the area on this side that goes from the test statistic t all the way out um, to the far right in that far right tail. Or we want the area where that t value is the same distance from the mean. So instead of at 1.98, we want the t value at negative 1.98 or beyond that to the left. So the p value is this area plus this area, which is the same as this area 
times two. So we need to find that. Now, since this is a student t distribution and not a standard normal distribution, we can't just look up this p value in a table. We have a list of critical values of t for different um, values of alpha, which will tell us like critical values of t when we have a certain amount of area in one tail or in two tails. Um, but we don't have complete tables for every um, possible sample size. And because the student t distribution actually depends on the sample size. Um, and that is typically denoted by the degrees of freedom of our test. Um, the degrees of freedom is given by this sample size minus one, which in our case is 500 minus one or 499. So we want the area beyond t equals 1.98 or 1.9807 approximately when we have 499 degrees of freedom um, and we want that area in two tails in that case. And so we can use technology to find that area in the two tails because we can't use table A2 to find this um, p-value that they're asking for. Um, so I will show you how to do that in Excel now. Okay, so if you're using Excel to find area in the tails for a t distribution, this uh, function that you use is pretty simple. It just depends on whether you've got a left-tailed test or a right-tailed test or a two-tailed test. So, um, in general, I'm going to type t dot dist if I want the area beyond a t score, and my t score is this 1.9807. Now, if I want the area to the left of a t score, I would use just t dot dist. If I want the area to the right of a t score, I would enter t dot dist, dist dot rt, rt for right. So if I use that one, I could get this area to the right. Let me show you how to find that. So I would use t dot dist dot rt, open parentheses. I want the t score 1.9807. And then I'll enter the degrees of freedom, which is 499 in our case. And that gives me that value. Now, if I don't just want the area to the right, but I want the area to the right and the area in that mirror image in the other tail, I can use the two-tailed um, t distribution. So I can enter here equals two or t dot dist dot two t for two-tailed. Open parentheses. It wants the x value, which is one point nine eight zero seven, and the degrees of freedom, which is four hundred ninety nine. And notice that if you take this value that we have right here and you double it, you get that value. So this area to the right of this value doubled is exactly the same value that you get when you use the t.dist.2t. Um, so that is my p value. So let me write that down. And I've got c. p is equal to t dot dist in excel dot um, 2t for two tails and then we open parentheses and we type in the 1.9807 and the 499 degrees of freedom and we get approximately 0 0.04817 so that is the command I used in Excel to get that p value. Now let's go back to the homework, my lab statistics, and see if it likes this p value. Okay, so it says to round to three decimal places as needed. So we'll type 0 0.048. Okay, great. Now just like any other um, p-value method for testing a hypothesis, just like those that we studied um, in chapter or in um, lesson 8.2 for testing claims about proportions, we're always comparing that probability of getting a test statistic as extreme as ours or more extreme to the alpha value in the problem statement. So in our case, the alpha value 
is this, it's that 0 0.01. So um, we're comparing P equals 0 0.048 to, to alpha equals 0 0.01. Now that P value, 0 0.048 is greater than the alpha value. If the P value is greater than the alpha value, we're saying that the probability that we get a T-score that is as extreme as our T-score or more extreme is, is more than the alpha um, that we're going to use to decide whether something is significantly high or significantly low. So that's saying that even though 0 0.48 is pretty small, given alpha equals 0 0.01, it's not small enough for us to reject the null hypothesis. So we're going to fail to reject the null in this case. And then if we want to come up with our conclusion in terms of the original claim, we need to think about whether that original claim included the condition of equality or not. Now remember our, our original claim was that um, the earthquakes are from a population with a mean equal to 6.00 kilometers. If we have failed to reject the null, well, that means we've failed to reject the claim. So we'll say there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the claim, or to conclude that the original claim that the mean of the population of earthquakes is uh, 6.00 kilometers is or is not correct. So we'll say there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the original claim that the mean of the population of earthquake depths is 6.00 kilometers is correct. Um, I don't know if we could say that there's evidence to conclude that that null hypothesis is correct, but we can say that there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the ori original claim is not correct. I think that's more accurate. Okay, because we can't prove that the mean is equal to 6.00 kilometers, but we can say there is not enough evidence to reject the idea that the claim is six, or that the um, mean of the population of earthquake, earthquake depths is equal to 6.00 kilometers. We can never accept the null, all we can do is fail to reject the null. So we're saying we don't have enough evidence to reject the claim. 